It's been 2,000 years since the glorious light of the cross illuminated a world veiled in darkness and confusion about the character of God. And still today, the greatest need of mankind is a revelation of God's love as revealed in the life of Christ. Amazing Facts presents the Everlasting Gospel. Coming to you each week from Sacramento Central Church in sunny California. Discover hidden treasures in God's Word today. I should probably uh, begin this morning by making a little announcement, uh, sort of a disclaimer. The message this morning is going to be unusual. Uh, it, out of the ordinary would be a better way to phrase it from um, the normal fare we have from week to week on Sabbath. Um, I have been impressed to speak upon the subject of both country living and the cities and more specifically when to leave the cities. And uh, I hope you'll be praying with me as I proceed and it may seem strange to you that Christians would talk about when to leave the cities. You may be wondering, are we supposed to leave the cities? Where does that come from? Well, I thought it'd be appropriate to start with a fable from Aesop. Would that be okay? How many of you have heard the story of the city mouse and the country mouse? Or different variations of this story. As the fable goes, the city mouse goes to visit his cousin who lives in the country. And he shakes his head and says, what a shame. Here you are living in this grass hut and you're just eating seeds. Why, back in the city, I feast like a king. I eat cheese and bread and cake and, and uh, as his city cousin was preparing to leave, the country mouse started looking around. He had felt content until his cousin made him discontent. He said, well, I'm going to come back and find out what it's like to feast that way. So he went with his city mouse cousin back to the city and he said, well, to start with, how'd you like some cake? He said, that sounds good, even though I don't know what cake is yet. They went out on the counter and there was a cake just sitting there, much more than they could ever eat. And so they just nibbled and he had never tasted anything so good until he heard his city cousin shout, run. And he could see from the panic on his face he better follow. And it looked like the cook evidently was coming in and had picked up a knife. And so they ran for cover. And after they went through a hole in the wall, they were huffing and puffing. He said, don't worry about this. He said, I know where there's some good cheese. And so uh, they went and they found a cupboard and in the cupboard was a cheese all unwrapped and the uh, country mouse had never tasted anything so aromatic. And while they were eating the cheese, pretty soon they heard, Mwear! and the city mouse said, run. And they both ran for their lives, huffing and puffing. And they were inside uh, a nook by the wall there. And, and uh, he thought, boy, this is not good for my heart. The country mouse was beginning to fret a little bit, but he said, well, look, there's some more cheese. And he started to go over and take a piece of cheese that was sitting on this con contraption. And, and his city cousin said, don't touch that. He said, if you eat that cheese, you're dead. It was a mouse trap. And so pretty soon he said, you know, I think I'm heading home <laughs> because I'm not sure that the city life is for me. And I think the proverb that Aesop came up with at the end of the uh, story is, I'll take my humble crumbs and seed in comfort over all of your finery with fear. In the message today, I'm going to try to do my best to strike a balance with where should Christians try to live? Uh, how should we place ourselves in the light of the Bible and inspired counsel? And I'm also going to weave in my own personal experience, and we're all influenced by that a little bit, and it'll help you gain some perspective. If nothing else, you'll better understand why Pastor Doug and Karen are where we are. And uh, I'm going to open up and get a little bit personal with you today about some of these things and these struggles. Uh, perhaps I should begin by reminding you that I was not raised in the country. I guess you could say I'm a city mouse. I was born in Burbank, California, but uh, by the time I was six years old, I was living in New York City. And so I grew up in Manhattan. For a while, we lived in L.A., and, and my dad moved to Miami, lived in Miami, Miami Beach, and went to school in a number of different places. And uh, I became discontent with the cities because the few times I'd go off to summer camp, I was in awe. Uh, the country just seemed to call me and the mountains, and uh, 
there was something about it I found just absolutely hypnotic. And I couldn't wait to get out. I guess I was looking for something real. And the city, you're surrounded by the things made by man, and it was so artificial. And so I made up my mind. I said, I, I want to find out what's real. And nature, to me, was real. And so I ran away to the mountains. First time I ran away to the mountains, I was 13 years old. Um, but I lived up there in the hills for about a day or two. And I was so lonely because it was just me in a tent, 13 years old up in the hills. I thought, I made it. I'm here. And then I thought, now what? You can only cook and eat so much. And I became very lonely. And so I went back home with my tail between my legs. I thought, next time I go, I'm going to have a friend with me. And so I finally ran away again at 15. I lost my friend somewhere along the way. He got arrested or something. And I ended up going to the mountains in Southern California. And I moved up into a cave way back in these desert mountains. And I'll tell you, it was real country living. I was a hermit. And I liked it. At this time, I was a little older. And I had grown accustomed to being alone. And I would go days without seeing anybody. And I find that even people who are involved in country living, I've met very few people that have gone five or six days, no telephone, no radio, no newspaper, no human voice, just you're by yourself. And uh, it, it's a very interesting experience if you've never done that. I'm not recommending it, but it's something you don't forget. Well, as I was living up there, I finally found a Bible. I accepted the Lord. I'm making a long story short. I was pretty much an atheist, and I was looking for religion. I thought I'd find God in nature. So I really loved country living because it was a God for me for a little while. When I read in the Bible, there was a verse in Isaiah 5, 8 that really resonated with me. And it says, Woe unto them who join house to house, and they add field to field, till there is no place where they may dwell alone in the midst of the land. And so I was yearning for this. But while I was living up there in the cave, and after I accepted the Lord, the Holy Spirit began to impress me. You can't just stay here and do nothing. I was so excited about the truth. I knew that God wanted me to share it. And I realized that the more I shared Christ, the more I was able to keep, the more I learned, the more real it was. When I just said, I'm glad I'm saved, too bad for all of those poor sardines living in the city, uh, something was wrong with my spirit. And I was reading this story about Elijah in the cave in the wilderness when he fled. And when I got to the part where God said to Elijah, what doest thou here? I mean, I was up in a cave really hiding out. And here God had given me this truth and I was so excited about it, but I was just very much putting my light under a bush. And God said, you need to share it with people. So now I went to the other extreme. I moved into the city. And I had a job, and this is a picture of when I had a little steak business, and that was the apartment. Lived in the city, and somebody gave me a book called Country Living. And I've got a copy of that here. Uh, it printed in 1946, and I started to read in that book some very important statements that I believed were true. And for instance, Country Living, page 32, where it says, Out of the cities, out of the cities, this is the message the Lord has been giving me. The earthquakes will come, the floods will come, and we are not to establish ourselves in the wicked cities where the enemy is served in every way and where God is so often forgotten. And then I read another statement here, and this is from uh, Testimonies, Volume 7. It's also in Country Living. The ungodly cities of our world are to be swept away by the besom of destruction. In the calamities that are now befalling immense buildings and large portions of the city, God is showing us what will come upon the whole earth. And so then I said, all right, I'm out of here. Got on the road, started hitchhiking, and I got picked up in Ukiah, and this couple said they were going to Kovalo. And I said, well, what's there? Oh, they said, there's nothing out there. They don't even have a theater in town. It's just surrounded by wilderness. I said, oh, that sounds good. I said, are there any caves? They said there were no redwoods. I said, well, are there any caves? I said, well, probably in the Black Butte River. And so went to Kovalo, moved into a cave. Eventually, I couldn't just stay in a cave and do nothing. Got a job down in town. Worked for the forestry. It was great. I was thinning trees up in the forest, but they said you need an address. And it's a, it's a long story, but God worked out a miracle where I was able to get a piece of land in the hills, started buying it with a partner up there. We went into the firewood business. He took off. I've never heard from him since, and I ended up with the, the property. And it turned out to be a real blessing over time because we've still had that land ever since. And that is the first house I built, and that's what you call country living. 
I was 18, 19 years old when I first built that, and that was an upgrade. It was living in a tent when we first moved up there. And yes, we had goats. We'd milk them right there in the house. They'd jump in. And uh, then I've got another picture. I actually improved the house. Here's the upgrade on the house. By the way, I built this with a chainsaw, the only power tools I had. You'd be surprised how much you could do. And on the inside, there were rafters. Lived up there six years, sold firewood, did odd jobs, mechanic work. But it was country living. It was a beautiful place. Beautiful view, gravity flow water. Still have the same property up there. But then I began to get the call to the ministry. Right after that, God began to open doors in town for me to preach in other churches. <laughs> but began to travel around and was preaching around the country in Texas and did mission work in New Mexico. And while we were away from the home, the shack up there, some... Uh, other country living people moved into our cabin while we were gone, started growing pot on our property. And uh, we finally went back. Karen and I burned that house down back. We were paying taxes on that shack. Can you believe that? So we, we burnt that down because people kept moving into it and it was real dilapidated. And then designed uh, a much nicer home that um, we thought would last. And this is a picture I'm almost embarrassed to tell you. That's our house now in Coval. It's about 20 years old. Designed it, built it, it's completely off the grid. Uh, solar electric, there's a closer picture here and you can see the solar panels up on the roof. And uh, I understand water power, solar power, wood power. We use wood power to heat the, the hot water in the winter time. Um, there aren't too many pastors out there that understand country living much better than Pastor Doug. I'm sure there are some, not too many. Let me just tell you right now, I speak fluent country living this is way out in the hills and uh, you just you know, this is you know been 30 years since we first got the property up there and to have three or four dogs depending on what day of the week it is and um, you know just way back in the woods bears coyotes you name it all the wildlife up there and when we take off we go up there now that's where I'd rather be nothing personal friends I like you but as soon as the Lord gives me just the slightest opportunity, I'm out of here. <laughs> I'm not here in Sacramento now because I don't like country living. I would much rather be there. But after several years living there, I had, I should say we had, the ideal situation. Pastoring the little Covalo Church, nice church, great people, had a school called, the, it's a little red schoolhouse, good Christian teachers, uh, country environment, did some conference evangelism, so I got to go out into some of the cities and do evangelism. Perfect situation. Could have done it forever. And then the Holy Spirit began to impress me that God wanted me to do something more. That impression I had back in the woods kept coming back. And... Um, the conference president was Don Schneider, came to our house. I knew he was committed when he came all the way to our house in Covalo. Coming to Covalo would have been enough, 12 miles further to our house. I said, Pastor Doug, we want you to go to Sacramento. And I thought, well, I'd have to be crazy. <laughs> to want to leave this, I'd have to live there. Can I commute? No, it's too far. It's four and a half hours from here. And um, really began to pray about that. And I'll tell you, it was a battle. And the Lord would not let me off the hook. And I, I really felt that God wanted me to do this to reach more people while time lingered. Karen and I needed a sign because this, you know, everything I'd read about country living, why would you take your family? As Stephen was three months old, is that right? Why would you take your family with all the counsel we've got and go from a situation like that and move even to the outskirts of Sacramento? And we prayed and prayed and we said, Lord, we need to know. And we began to study the subject of country living because I was feeling the great paradox. I was reading verses that talked about working the cities and reading these verses saying, flee the cities. And I was trying to figure out, what am I supposed to do? And I kept being impressed by the Lord. This was where I was supposed to go. Now, I've been here 13 years. I hope you don't disagree. As some of you, if you're thinking, well, Doug, you made the wrong decision. Well, then I guess the last 13 years was not the Lord's leading but you're going to have a hard time convincing me of that. So all these things are happening, and I'm still, every day I'm thinking, 
I want to go to Kovalo. That's a chant I say to myself all the time. <laughs> Every day. Because, pardon me, friends, the house is there. It's paid for. We could sell firewood and have all we needed to pay the taxes. It'd be so easy. Um, and it burns me up. Karen actually called to get prices on firewood here in town. We got cords and cords of firewood. It's just too far away. So all of this is the context of the experience that uh, I'm coming to you from. I struggle with this. Uh, how do you relate reaching the world with the country living? Well, we've got so many statements. It is not God's purpose that people should be crowded into cities, huddled together in terraces and tenements. In the beginning, he placed our first parents amid the beautiful sights and sounds. He desires us to rejoice in today. The more nearly we come in harmony with God's original plan, the more favorable will be our position to secure health of body, mind, and soul. That's Ministry of Healing, page 363. I believe that. More and more as time advances, our people will have to leave the cities. For years we've been instructed, instructing our brethren and sisters that especially families with children should plan to leave the cities as the way opens before them to do so. What are some of the benefits of country living? And this is not all. This is a small list. Fresher air, generally, than the cities. Clean water. You can see God's creation. You got wholesome food. You can eat out of your garden. Room for outdoor labor. You can avoid the worldly influences in the city. Grow your own fruits and vegetables, not to mention all the stress and the traffic. Wherever there's more people, there's going to be more problems because the human heart is desperately wicked. And it's, yeah, every now and then you'll hear of some horrific crime in the country, but typically the cities, you've got a greater concentration of violence and strife and bloodshed and pollution and these different issues. Now, some of you are saying, Pastor Doug, you're coming down pretty hard on those of us that have to because of our, our family. Some people are married in blended families where maybe some are not converted and don't feel this way or their work, um, their finances, it's just not preparing them. And I, I want to strike a balance today. There are two extremes to which people go on the subject of living in the cities, country mouse, city mouse. One extreme is what I was doing when I was a virtual hermit, living way out in the hills, only thinking about my comfort, my security, being insulated from the evils of mankind. I mean, I had a pretty, uh, pretty nasty attitude about humanity and how evil it was, uh, coming from my perspective of living in the cities. But then I realized how much Jesus loves people, he wants to reach them. And then the other extreme is people who say, well, because we're supposed to reach the cities, they get right down in the middle of it. So instead of reaching the cities, the city reaches them. And they are converted by the intense, concentrated evil influences that you're going to find in a city. Now, as we talk about cities, please keep something in mind. Cities are different. Uh, I've been around the world, trust me. Cities are different. If I was told I had to live in a city, I'd want to know what city, first thing. Uh, Bombay, and some of the cities in India, they still launch dead bodies out into the river. And uh, the streets are extremely unsanitary. You see rats running everywhere. You can still see rats running everywhere in New York City. And um, that would be different than maybe the city of Lincoln. I'm not even talking about Lincoln, Nebraska, for those who are watching. I'm talking about Lincoln, California. It's a fairly new city. The air is still reasonably clean, and you're not going to have as many of the problems as you might have in downtown Chicago, for instance. Would you all agree that some cities can be different? There, I'm not trying to justify living in cities. I'm just saying let's be intelligent about this. For instance, um, Acts chapter 17, verse 11. The Bible says, But these in Berea the city of Berea, were more noble than those in Thessalonica. And they received the word of God with all readiness of mind and they searched the scriptures daily. The very nature of the people living in Berea, Paul says, or Luke says, was better than those in Thessalonica. Why did God destroy Sodom and Gomorrah and the four cities of the plain, but he didn't destroy all the other cities in Canaan? Very simple answer, because there was a difference. When Lot moved to Sodom, the Bible says, but the men of Sodom 
were sinners exceedingly before the Lord. So are we all agreed that there could be varying circumstances in varying cities? Are we agreed on that? And I'm not trying to justify city living. The other thing about cities you want to consider is the closer you get, cities typically have a downtown. They typically have a core. And as you get near to the, the concentration of people, the more heavily populated areas, and you get a little further out, things seem to improve the further away you get. Would you agree with that? You know, this church location, when it was built, was country. Some of you remember back when they bought this, and there were fields around here. It's hard for us to imagine right now, because you've got to go quite a ways before you find a field right now by this church. So some people started out country living. Some of you who live around the church, when you bought your home, you said, I'm following country living. Well, you were swallowed by the city because the sprawl tends to grow. So these are just some things to keep in mind. We have a command also, not only to avoid the evil that you'll find in the city and capitalize on the benefits of country living, to work the cities. Consider this for a uh, moment. The percentage of the world's population that lives in a major city around 1900 was 15 to 20 percent lived in a major city, North America. 29 percent in 1950. It went from 15 to 20 percent to 29 percent. In 1950, I'm sorry, 1998, that went to 47 percent of the people in North America were living in or by a major city. Right now, approximately 50% of the people in North America, I'm not even talking about the other parts of the world, live by a major city. By the year 2015, it's expected to be 55%. Now, what is the Great Commission? Go into all the world. Don't put your light under a bush. Has probation closed for the cities yet, or are there still people in the cities that need to hear the gospel? Then we need to say, how do we reach the cities without being stuck in the cities and the influences there. And uh, what is the context for this? Let me read a few quotes to you, please. This is from Letter 106, 1910, this was written. Many in the cities are still without the light of the gospel message. Those who neglect to sound forth the last message of warning will in the future suffer deep regret. My message is let companies be organized to enter the city. Seek proper locations for holy meetings. Circulate our literature. Our restaurants must be in the cities, for otherwise the workers in these restaurants could not reach the people and teach them the principles of right living. And for the present, we'll have to occupy meeting houses. She calls churches meeting houses. Well, that's what this is. In the cities. That's General Conference Bulletin, April 6, 1903. We, need, we all need to be wide awake that as the way opens, we might advance the work in the large cities. Not just cities, the large cities. We are far behind in following the light given us to enter the cities and erect memorials for God. What do you think those memorials are? Plaques? Statues? Churches? Now, I remember it was right here. It was at Bill May's funeral. Cyril Miller came up to me and he tapped me on the sh shoulder and he said, Doug, we need to reach New York City. This is 1998. Nine, I think it was, or 98. And he says, you live there, you understand it, we want you to go. And the North American Division asked Amazing Facts to go to New York City. Do you think I wanted to do that? Karen and I had to live right in the city. It just was not practical. Couldn't make the meetings on time to commute from outside. We had to get an apartment right on 34th Street. We'd look up, the, our, we had a one-room apartment, look up $4,000 a month for a one-room apartment little skylight at night. Every night we looked up, saw the Empire State Building. It was right above us and lived right there in the midst of that. It was a struggle. But you know what? Over the years, you know how many people have told us they came to the Lord and were baptized as a result of that series? Not only in New York, but from the tapes worldwide. Thousands. And so it, I kept thinking, oh Lord, I hate it here. That's why I left when I was a kid. I never had any desire to go back. But God said, go back. This last year, he told us to go to Washington. And then before uh, Madras and Manila, and I could just start naming cities of the world where he sends us because Jesus loves people and where are most of the people? So we've got to find a way to reach the people in the cities 
in the world without the world reaching us. And that's what the challenge is for Christians. Oh, again here. The disciples of Christ are his representatives upon earth. And God designs they shall be scattered all over the country, in the towns, cities, villages. Now, you're saying, Doug, that people should move into the cities? Especially, no, if you have children, I don't recommend that. Uh, try to live on the outside, the suburbs or something. Villages as, as light amidst the darkness. Again, well, that was Testimonies, Volume 8. In the book, Christian Service, 180, we see the great need of missionary work to carry the truth not only to foreign countries, but to those who are near us. Close around us are cities and towns in which no effort is being made to save souls. Why should not families who know the present truth settle in these cities and villages to set up the standard of Christ? Now, I don't believe this is telling us that families should go to some of these more offensive cities because I think you need to consider those things. But here's a principle I want to give you that look at everything in this context. I know sometimes when I'm thinking of running for cover so I could be in my country home, I'm thinking selfishly. Um, and you and I know people who, uh, they panic with the idea of getting out of the cities and they're, they're, they're hearing about the destruction that's going to come and they're hearing about the, the benefits. And the driving force in a lot of it is me, me, me. How can I save myself? Well, you know what? You can't save yourself by moving to the country. That's not what saves you. Because I know some people that pride themselves on country living, but they've got a satellite dish way out there in their beautiful country home with their gardens, and they fill their minds with all kinds of garbage every day, and you're not sanctified because you get flowers in the yard or fruit trees out back. Pastor Doug, are you saying that there's a conflict between these statements that say flee the cities, out of the cities, and work the cities? No, there's not. The cities must be worked. The millions living in these congested centers are to hear the third angel's message. And especially it's talking about the congested centers. One more quote here. This is from Pacific Union Recorder, January 12, 1911. God's people are not doing the work he would have them do for the cities. I've borne this testimony again and again until it seemed as if God's people were not going to do the work. But the cities must be entered. And other times she says, I've been up all night. I can't sleep because I think about all the masses in the cities. And who's doing the work? Now, you know why this message is so important? If we misunderstand our responsibility to both our families and protecting them from the evil of the cities and the balance of reaching the cities, people will be lost. It could be you and your families because you're too far in. It could be the people in the city that are lost because you're too far out. You hear that? I'm going to say it again because that's really the heart of what I'm trying to say. If we don't understand this message about where we should place ourselves, now, you know, God wants some people to go out in the remote districts because there are little communities there and he wants them to be salt and light there. And, and there's no question about that. But generally speaking, if God's people, because they're thinking about their own protection and we're going to hoard our food and get ready for the end of the world, we're going to save ourselves by being real savvy about country living and we become hermits, we, this is not the time for isolation for separating ourselves so that we, we can't reach people. Then what happens is people are lost because all we're thinking about is ourselves. The other danger is because of convenience and maybe you get paid better and the more to tickle the imagination in the city, we're going to lose ourselves or our families like Lot did by being too close. So we've got to know, Lord, where do you want me to be? And I can't overemphasize we need to pray about where he wants us to go and how he wants to lead us. In fairness, I know that I, I might be making some of you uncomfortable. That's probably a pastor's job description. You need to be aware when you read Country Living, and I love this book and I treasure uh, the information here. It's what you call a compilation. Do you know what a compilation is? Are you all aware Ellen White never read Country Living? This was developed in 1946. Now, do you know what was happening in the world between 1940 and 1945? Anyone ever heard of World War II? What do you think the feelings were in the church during that time when the atom bomb had just been dropped, the nuclear buildup had begun, they had just witnessed many thousands of major cities in the world being totally decimated with bombs. They believed that the Lord was coming any year. And the trustees of the White Estate said, we need to tell our people to get out of the cities. And so they went through 
The 15 million words that Ellen White wrote, did you know she wrote about 15 million words? 50,000 pages, wrote more than any other woman in American history. That's quite a feat. 50,000 pages of handwritten manuscript and they assembled everything they could find about the danger of the cities and the benefits of the country and they assembled it in this booklet of about 32 pages and 11,000 words. Now, if you read this by itself without balancing it with everything else, sugar cane's good. But if you just eat sugar, sugar is the result of concentrating what you would get naturally in sugar beets or sugar cane. It is a concentration. In its natural state, you can handle it okay. But if you don't mitigate it with the other material where it's naturally surrounded, you can get pure sugar, you become a diabetic. Sometimes people will just take something like this and they use it as uh, the primary source and, and you can end up doing rash things and you need to be careful. Did that make sense? And so read it for what it is and understand that it's a compilation. Understand the context of how it was written and the times in which it was written. Let me share some things with you about what were the conditions of the world in the 1800s, early 1900s in the cities. Let me share a few things with you. What was the condition of the cities in the 1800s? Many of the poverty-stricken families, now this, this is just from some history books. Many of the poverty-stricken families that lived in the city residence in the tenement houses were all crammed together. A majority of these very poor families lived in three small compartments, sharing a kitchen and two bedrooms with one another. All rooms were very dark and stuffy. Jacob Rees, in a, a prominent 19th century writer, describes the battle with the slums. The space that separated the two tenements as being too narrow to let the light through, too busy carrying up the smells from below to bring any air down. The plumbing systems of tenements were not up to par, and often the pipes that ran through the houses were not connected to any city sewage system, but ran simply into the basement. These conditions caused many problems, including disease control. Cholera, yellow fever, smallpox were among the many deadly illnesses that ravaged the poor. In one house, speaking of New York City, 20 cases of typhoid fever were reported in one year. There was sometimes only one bathtub for all these families, and it would hang in an air shaft. Many times, four of the families on the floor shared a sink that stayed in the hallway. The sink was the only water source and was frequently filthy and a menace to health. And then the references. By the late 1800s, New York City's human population was exploding, fueled by waves of immigrants and torrents of untreated human waste and chemical discharges ravaged the harbor's waters. Raw sewage accumulated 10 feet deep on portions of the bottom, rotting and giving off methane gas so vigorously that sightseers would go to the edge and watch the waters seethe and spit. The waters actually boiled. Now, when I lived in New York City, it was a lot worse than it is today because they didn't have the sanitation rules then that they've got now regarding dogs and other things. The, the decomposition robbed the harbor of oxygen. The only living thing was bacteria. Sheets of floating garbage walk, washed back and forth on the beaches carrying waste and dead animals to the swimmers. Oil slicks would ignite on the water surface. There's a lot here I won't read for you. Some reaches of the harbor were so polluted they became legendary. Stenches from the creeks could be smelled for blocks and sometimes a year the people would have to flee. The air was very polluted in the cities because they heated the cities back then largely with wood and coal and the factories were powered by wood uh, and coal rather. Coal fueled much of the early electric production. Coal-fired power plants proved efficient but highly polluting. Coal also fueled much of the early heavy industry in the U.S., which had begun to grow up in the major eastern cities such as New York and Philadelphia. Coal also proved necessary in the production of steel and iron ore. Consequently, the water was frequently polluted by acid, iron, sulfur, aluminum, and other toxic ions drained away from these mines into the streams. In the late 1800s, St. Louis was a city of great growth and rapid development. Industrial growth produced billows of sooty coal smoke that took its toll on St. Louis and the environment. On November 28, 1939, that's not that long ago, 
The worst smoke cloud in St. Louis history enveloped the downtown area. Street lights had to be turned on at midday. People could not see buildings across the street. Traffic was delayed. It was known as Black Tuesday. Now, the reason I'm reading some of these disturbing things is when you read a lot of the statements about conditions in the city, just be intelligent about the time it was written, the context, and then apply those things with the other writings about where to position ourselves. Ultimately, what is a Christian? Christian's a follower of Christ. Am I right? And we need to follow his example. Um, what is the example of Jesus? Luke 21, verse 37 and 38. In the daytime, he was teaching in the temple in Jerusalem. But at night, he went out and stayed on the mountain called Olivet. Where did he stay on Mount Olives? Garden of Gethsemane. Now here's Jesus as a pattern. He worked in the city during the day, but at night he went to as close a country environment as he could find, which happened to be on the Mount of Olives, and it was the Garden of Gethsemane. Matthew 11.1 1. Now it came to pass when Jesus finished commanding his twelve disciples that he departed from there to teach and to preach in their cities. Do we have a work to do to reach the people in the cities? Yes, we do. Jesus said, Matthew 10.23 When they persecute you in this city, flee into another. For assuredly I say to you, you will not have gone through the cities of Israel before the Son of Man comes. What's the example of the apostles? Well, I told you, they, Paul and others, they spent time in the wilderness. The disciples were by the Sea of Galilee. They were on the mountainside, and then they would go into the cities. They would sort of do like Enoch, where he had a home in the mountains, but he was a preacher of righteousness in the cities. And we need to know how to have that balance. Um... I lost my place here about the apostles. Acts 8.40 But Philip was found in Azotos, and passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. Acts 14, verse 3 Therefore they stayed in the city of Iconium a long time, speaking boldly in the Lord. Acts 18, verse 9 through 11 Now the Lord spoke to Paul in a night vision, Do not be afraid, but speak, and do not keep silent, for I am with you. And no one will attack you to hurt you, for I have many people in this city. Do you think that was true only of Macedonia, or is it true of Sacramento? When God no longer has people in the city, what happens? What happened when God couldn't find five righteous in Sodom? When there's no salt, there's no purpose. It's lost its savor. And I think that there are still a lot of people in a lot of these cities that are waiting they're sincere and they need to be gathered in. We need to find out how can we reach them and not just thinking about protecting ourselves. You know, the spirit of a missionary is a spirit of cross-bearing where you are willing to deny yourself and take risk to save others. I know some people that I admire. I, I frankly think they're better than I am because they left very comfortable circumstances in North America where they had country homes nice occupations and they've gone into foreign mission fields with their families where they're in some very dangerous places but you know sometimes to do mission work you can't just send everybody when they're old sometimes you've got to go when you're young enough where your kids can learn the language and others can learn the language and you can raise up soul winners and they expose themselves to dangers and risk and it isn't always convenient we just need to know where's the Lord sending me so how do we reach the people in the cities? The idea is outposts. On the outsides of the city, something like lighthouses. You know, a lighthouse doesn't shine if it's in the city because it gets confused with all the lights of the city. It needs to be separated somewhat from the city in order for the ships to say, ah, that's an, out that's a, uh, an outpost, it's a lighthouse. And often the keeper of the outpost or the lighthouse lives there by it. Outside of the cities, at a reasonable distance, we should try to secure places where we can meet the criteria of the benefits of country living. Very simply, if you can find a place where you can have fresh air, clean water, sanitary living conditions, hopefully enough geography or, or dirt where you can grow some of uh, your own fruits and vegetables and enjoy the things of God's creation, avoid the evil influences that might be seen in a congested city environment, that's a great situation. You don't want to be so far away that you can't be ministering to where the people are. 
And let's say God's given some people a special calling to go to isolated places and minister in small communities. I've lived in dark counties before and, and uh, I'm all for that. But most people, that's not where they are. And if God's people all put their tail between their legs right now when Jesus is about to come and flee for our own selfish protection and not be where we can reach the cities, that's a concern. That wouldn't be from the Lord. That would be from the enemy. And we need to be very careful about that. Well, how far out do you have to go? Would you like, I can't tell you where you're supposed to live, but I'll give you some guidelines. The Bible says we should have meeting houses in the cities. Uh, I'm sorry. Yes, the Bible said that too. But I read several inspired quotes that talked about having meeting houses in the cities. Back when that was written, horse and buggy was the fastest way to get around. So they weren't very far from the cities because they would take buggies into the meeting houses. So these outposts, you want to be far enough out where the sprawl is not going to catch up with you too quick. And you still don't have to spend so much time in a commute that you don't have time with your family and you don't have time for other practical things. Some people live so far away from the cities. What do you think, friends? Do you want Karen and I to move back to Kobo and commute once a week? You just give me permission, we'll do it. We'll come down Friday night, leave Sunday morning. It's not a very practical commute to serve the people here. Would you agree? And so you've got to strike that balance. What if you find a place you can't get all 25 of the top benefits of country living, but you can get 20 of them? Well, if that's where the Lord's leading, you don't say, no, I don't have all 25. You've got to be intelligent, friends, and be balanced. You might say, yeah, I can go to Kovalo. You could say that with me. I want to go to Kovalo. But yeah, you'll have all 25, but you can't practically reach people for the ministry he's given you. And so we need to have this balance. When are we supposed to leave the cities? Now. That's what I've been saying. At least, especially the congested part. She talks about the heart of the cities. We ought to get out. When disaster strikes, when the terrorist bombs go off, when the planes hit the building, where did it hit? Do they strike the suburbs? It's the congested hearts of these cities that are especially at risk. And you can almost look at the skyline of a city and see where you want to get away from. It goes like this, and then it goes whoop, whoop, and it goes like that. You want to be out there somewhere. Country Living, page 31. Repeatedly, the Lord has instructed us that we are to work the cities from outpost centers. In these cities, we're to have houses of worship as memorials for God. But institutions for the publication of our literature, for the healing of the sick, and for the training of workers are to be established outside the cities. Only two things should really be in the cities as far as institutions, places of worship, restaurants. If you put a restaurant out in uh, the hills where I live, not going to be in business long or you won't have very many cu customers. You got to put it where you can educate the people. Why do you think the Lord opened the way for us to get this property right on the outside of town? Because we want to have an evangelism training center where we'll not only have a place of worship, but we could be training people to work the capital of California and still be located where the workers can live in more rural areas. This is an ideal situation. Here we are at the end of time for us to fulfill the counsel we've been given for years to develop an outpost. And it's a beautiful environment. Maybe you can't tell from the, the aerial picture, but you look on the back of the land there and you've got a pond and and trees and a beautiful situation for an evangelism training school and to reach people. I think God is leading. When are we supposed to flee? Jesus tells us it was our scripture reading, the abomination of desolation. Turn to Matthew 24. Verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world. Would that include the cities? for a witness unto all nations, and then the end will come. He goes on, he says, Therefore when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, oh, and I could uh, reiterate this prayer, whoever reads, let him understand. Let those that are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on his housetop not even come back, take anything out of his house. Let him who is in the field, don't even go back and get your clothes from the house. Woe to those who are with who are pregnant and those who are nursing babies in those days and pray that your flight may not be in the winter neither on the Sabbath day for then will be great tribulation such as not has been since the beginning of the world until this time no nor ever shall be in fact unless those days were shortened no flesh would be saved but for the elect's sake those days will be shortened now Jesus made this prediction in about 30 AD 
A generation later, in 40 AD, Jerusalem was surrounded by the Romans and ultimately destroyed. There was a brief window that was provided for the Christians to flee. And if they didn't recognize that window, and if they tried to pack their stuff and pull it on an ox cart, they would have been caught. They had a very narrow window of time to flee. And the Bible says when you see Jerusalem, Luke words it differently. When you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, let those that be in Judea flee into the hills. That's in Luke 21, verse 20. Let me read a quote to you from the book uh, Great Controversy, I believe it is. When the idolatrous standards of the Romans should be set up in the holy ground, which extended some furlongs outside the city walls, then the followers of Christ were to find safety in flight. What does flight mean? Flee. You're not packing your bags and looking for new real estate. You're running for your life. When the warning signs should be seen, those who would escape must make no delay. Throughout the land of Judah, as well as Jerusalem itself, the signal for flight must be immediately obeyed. He who chanced to be on the housetop must not even go down to his house to save his most valued treasures, unless it's your children. Those who are working in the fields or the vineyards must not take time to return for their outer garment laid aside while they should be toiling in the heat of the day. They must not hesitate a moment lest they be involved in the general destruction. Does everybody know that the day is coming when there's going to be a great time of trouble and our cities are going to experience general destruction? When does that happen? That happens just as probation closes. When Lot fled from Sodom, was there any more preaching going on in Sodom? Or were they doomed? When the disciples fled from Jerusalem back in 70 A.D., was there any more preaching and evangelism going on in Jerusalem? No. Keep in mind, from the time Jesus said this, he gave them 40 years of grace before they had to run for their lives. Did the disciples preach in Jerusalem up until that time? They did, because they were told to reach the people there. Jesus said, beginning in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth. So they needed to be ready to run. And there will still be some of God's people that will probably be working the cities up to that moment, and they're not going to have time. They're going to have to jump in their car and run. I mean, it's going to be like that. What is that sign? How do we know when that time comes to flee when probation's closed for the cities? This is from uh, Testimonies, Volume 5, page 464. Matter of fact, um, I think the whole quote, oh yeah, that was GC, page, Great Controversy, page 88, the first quote. This is Testimonies, Volume 5, 464. The time is not far distant when, like the early disciples, we shall be forced to seek refuge in desolate and solitary places. That's why I haven't taken a tour to my cave. I might need it again someday. You all know where I live in Kovalo. As the siege of Jerusalem by the Roman armies was the signal for flight, we're talking about fleeing, to the Judean, um, flight to the Judean Christians, so the assumption of power on the part of our nation in a decree enforcing the people Sabbath, when there is a law that is compelling us to recognize Sunday as a day of worship. I'm talking about a general law. There have always been Sunday laws on the books and there are uh, different ones that have bubbled to the surface over time. But it's talking about a general law that is being forced upon the people. That is the sign. Enforcing the papal Sabbath, this will be a warning to us. It will then be time to leave the large cities preparatory to the smaller ones for retired homes and secluded places among the mountains. Why? Well, for one thing, persecution is going to make it very difficult. When there's a Sunday law and we're still preaching the Sabbath truth, uh, is it going to be safe for us to go into congested places and stand on the corner and tell everybody that? Or will we be seen as lawbreakers? That's the small time of trouble when you want to go to more secluded places. Finally, when probation closes, we're going to be fleeing for desolate places. And let me add, and that's a time when you're going to want to remember Lot's wife. Don't look back. Now, can we prepare for that time of trouble, the big time of trouble? You know, I meet people every now and then that um, the big time of trouble, not the small time of trouble, you know what the difference is. Big time of trouble is when the plagues are falling. And you and I know people who have gone and they've bought lots of food and they've stored it away and they've got all their provisions. And is hoarding food going to save us in that time? Let me read you a quote. I think it's from book Maranatha 181. The Lord has shown me in vision repeatedly. You either got to 
believe it or not, that it is contrary to the Bible to make any provision for our temporal wants in the time of trouble. I saw that if the saints have food laid up by them or in the fields in the time of trouble, when sword, famine, and pestilence are in the land, it will be taken from them by violent hands and, and strangers will reap their fields. Then will be the time for us to wholly trust in God. He will sustain us. I saw that our bread and that our water would be sure at that time. We should not lack or suffer hunger. The Lord has shown me that some of His children would fear when they see the price of food rising. They'd buy food, they lay it up for the time of trouble, hoarding food. Then at the time of need, I saw them go to their food. They open their pantry and they look at it and it's bread worms and was full of living creatures not fit for use. Did the Lord take care of the children of Israel when they went through the wilderness? Feed them around? Did He take care of Elijah when he fled in the wilderness? Does the Bible say when the woman fled into the wilderness, God fed her there? Revelation 12. He'll feed us at that time. Now's the time for us to position ourselves for maximum evangelistic potential. Jesus wants to say, has probation closed for the world or do we have a work to do? So, at the same time, we don't want to be living, and especially those of you who have children, in a place where they're surrounded with these evil influences. Let's move cautiously. Let everyone take time to consider carefully and not be like the man in the parable who began to build and was not able to finish. Not a move should be made, but that movement and all that it portends are carefully considered, everything weighed. There may be individuals who will make rash movements to do something and enter into some business and they don't know anything about it. This God does not require. Think candidly, prayerfully, studying the Word of God with carefulness and prayerfulness, with mind and heart awake to hear the voice of God. And there's a number of other statements here about moving prayerfully and seeing how God is leading you. There's a balance that I guess I'm trying to share with you. I, I have been, I think, on both sides. Uh, nobody here is going to say I don't understand country living. Nobody here is going to say I don't understand city living. I've been a city mouse and a country mouse. And uh, in this world, I don't want to be in the cities. Nothing against you. I love this church. I love the people. But I'm only here because of the evangelistic mission that God has given our family. And I hope you'll pray for us. I've said, Lord, if you want us there, then I need you to compensate because we still have our children. Now, granted, God's given us a great place. We've got a creek in the backyard. We've got a nice, uh, great neighbors. I mean, it's a safe neighborhood. And so, you know, we've got clean air and clean water and a lot of benefits, but we don't have everything on that list. I wish we had. And uh, I keep chanting, I want to go to Covalo. And God says, not yet. And that day's coming. And I got a little extra room up there. If you're nice to me, maybe I'll let you come when that time comes. If, I mean, really, I've thought that before. There's a little more land than we need. And I've thought before, well, maybe that's for those who can't afford it. Some people are going into debt to try and get a place in a country and they have no work and everything. And it, it's, a, it's a desperation and it worries me. As your pastor, I just want you to have a balance of what these messages are dealing with. Amen? Amen. Ultimately, the ideal is you want a city home and a country home. Jesus said he's building you a city home. Isn't that right? He said, I go to prepare a place for you. And where is that? It's in the New Jerusalem, the city of God. And then it tells us, you'll go forth from the New Jerusalem and you will build houses and inhabit them and you will plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them. And ultimately, we're going to have the, the benefit of both. But we won't have to worry about that city there. Why? Because there's only converted people in that city and there'll be no evil. Amen? So I pray, I know some of you are, are making decisions and I want the Lord to lead and each member, I say, you just make sure the Lord is leading you. We've got some members that just went to a foreign country. They call us once a week, the Hebbards. They're doing mission work with their family. I want you to pray for these people. And we've got others who are being led to go to smaller, more remote communities where there's no light of the gospel there. You want to pray for these people. There's still a great work to do here. Amen? And our church... We're getting ready to do something with this new property that I think can be a fulfillment of the counsel we've got and it's extremely exciting. Do we know when the Lord's coming? Not exactly. You know, there are some statements. You will not be able to say, this is a review and Herald, March 22nd, 1892. You'll not be able to say that the Lord is coming in one, two, or five years. Be careful about that. Neither are you to put off his coming by saying, maybe not for 10 or 20 years. Be careful of that. 
In other words, we need to plan and work and give as though we may be here for a little while. You realize when Jesus first went to heaven, the disciples thought he was coming back imminently. And when after 40 years he still hadn't come, they really began to get worried as they saw Jerusalem destroyed. We don't know how much longer we're going to be here, friends, but I think God has given us a work to do, and we need to do it not with one hand, but with both hands. Jesus is coming soon. He's called us to come to him and go for him. At the same time, protect our families as far as possible from these evil influences. Hey, let me read something else to you. I'm almost done. When iniquity abounds in a nation, there is always to be heard some voice giving warning and instruction, as the voice of Lot was heard in Sodom. Yet Lot could have preserved his family from many evils had he not made his home in this wicked, polluted city. All that Lot and his family did in Sodom could have been done by them, even if they had lived at some place a distance away from the city. Enoch walked with God, and yet he did not live in the midst of any city polluted with every kind of violence and wickedness, as did Lot in Sodom. It's possible for us to work the cities without the cities working us. Amen? So let's pray that God will give us wisdom. And let's pray that uh, we inhabit that place He's prepared for us in the city and that we can build our homes in the country. Amen? Amen. If, we, if we ask the Lord, Jesus, I believe He's been leading our family where we are today. I really do. And He'll lead you too. That's why we're going to sing our closing hymn, Savior Like a Shepherd Lead Us. What is it, 545? Dear Father in heaven, Lord, we pray that we have gotten a balanced picture from your word and from inspiration regarding what the, the plan is to both protect our families, to avoid the evil influences in the cities today, and yet still be evangelists and be able to reach others for you. We're asking Jesus, like our shepherd, to lead us. And ultimately, Lord, we're looking forward to that day where we can again be in a garden and there won't, will not be all of the, the sin and the disease and the evil that we see in the world today. In the meantime, help us to be faithful, to share the good news, that we might share that Eden with as many as possible. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.